am i audible okay good evening and um, i think i'll just move to the next slide okay uh, it's an absolute pleasure whenever i talk about this love brand of ours uh, to an audience as exciting as this uh, so good evening um 90 years 90 years is a really long time really long time it's about time uh, that we see three generations um it's about time that uh, really calls out an entire period of evolution right um and whenever we deep dive into how have we uh, transformed this humble little brick into this timeless legacy uh, there are many many things that come to mind and if i have to really decode uh, you know the journey of this brand to you and bring to life how these 90 years really happened i thought of various formats in my head on what would be the best way of actually bringing the story to you and then i decided that the best way to do this would be actually to do what we do best at the lego group that is tell the children a story and so here i am to tell you the story the story of this brand and the people behind it from time to time what i have also tried to do here is to basically break the story into a few chapters you know from my side and each chapter essentially is actually going to be a little bit of a peek into a decade of sorts um the challenges the opportunities the times that were and how the brand really adopted evolved faced those adversities and came out as the timeless brand that it is today right um so to go back 90 years or maybe even before that where did all of this begin and if i have to really go back to where it all started it has to go back to 1916 and in 1916 this is the story of a young 24 year old boy a little 24 year old danish boy called ole kirk christensen right um he was living in this town called billun it is the house of the brick a very very small town in denmark and this all started with him buying a little factory a little factory for about 10000 danish kronje what did the factory do you think well it built everything doors windows cabinets shelves uh, chests uh, coffins and that's what happened for a quite for quite a while till about 1929 and then 1929 struck and the world around ole started changing what did happen well 1929 is the time when the world started reshaping because the new york stock market had crashed um it had to actually send the whole world into a dramatic economic collapse after that um and thousands and thousands of companies were shutting down inflation was skyrocketing and ole obviously realized that his entire customer base had started dwindling because people were obviously you know sticking to basic essentials and where was the place for all of this um so with a heavy heart he had to let a lot of his employees go and when he did let the last employee of his go forever he he actually found an article in one of the danish magazines what did the article say well the article actually talked about something very interesting uh, it said that there is good manufacturing sense or rather good sense in manufacturing uh, utility items utility items like step ladders iron boards you know things like that because possibly people were moving from hiring people to doing these jobs themselves the last item in that list of products that was mentioned was the item that was to change ole's life forever it said toys very reluctantly so ole decided to allocate a little space in his factory to building toys as well and um that's the chapter 1 of the story the wooden duck uh, so this is the mid 1930s that we are talking about um ole was producing furniture yet and all the other utility items he was also producing toys right now this is also the time when there was a little tussle between his head and heart and the child that ole was in his heart he decided to give his heart a listen and what did that mean it meant that he said that let's focus on producing only one thing that is toys a huge punt one would say but an exceptionally fateful one 
because one day this company which started by building wooden toys the wooden duck was the first toy that the factory produced was going to become the largest toy brand in the world so this was also the first break in the evolution of ole kirk christensen or the lego brand necessity was the mother of invention right we move ahead and uh, that takes me to chapter 2 now you know the factory could not be called the balloon wood working factory as it was called earlier it had to have a fancy name because it was producing only toys so what do you do when a young guy actually wants a young company to have a different fancy name again ole did this in his very typical style he actually opened a contest to his employees and he said think of a fancy interesting name that denotes what we do there's a precious prize to it and the prize to it was uh, was something really precious it was ole's favorite homemade wine who do you think won the contest um it was ole himself he actually put together two danish words like got as you see them here and he actually combined that to give the brand its iconic name lego it essentially translates in english as play well and that is the name that we have lived with for years it was only very recently that we discovered that the name in latin also has a meaning incidentally the name means i assemble such are the interesting stories with the brand uh we move on and we see that you know we have settled in the 1930s and we are entering the 1940s ole's sons have joined the business and are showing active interest and this chapter 3 which is very close to my heart is a chapter that i will narrate to you in the words of godfred christensen his third son so basically godfred comes back from office one evening and he says dad it's a great day why it's a great day because we've made a lot of money today how Uh, we've made a lot of money because we've cut down on some costs okay uh, go on uh, says the father he says you know today i had uh, an order uh, from the danish cooperatives for two boxes of ducks um, i actually gave them those two boxes today up the station and how did you save money in this entire process well you know we typically give our ducks three coats of clear varnish I decided to give them only two this time. They looked good enough, and I have packed them and given them off. After all, they are for the Danish cooperatives. They wouldn't notice. By the time I picked my head up, my dad was frowning. He said, "Godfred, don't you know this is wrong? You will go back to the station right now, open up those boxes, give those ducks a third coat of varnish, pack them back, go back to the station and deliver them where they have to be delivered." you will not go to bed until this is done and you have no help allocated to doing this there was no arguing with dad anymore and godfred had to complete this task at night that night was the biggest lesson that godfred actually learned about what quality means the next morning when he got up he actually took a slab of wood and these were the letters that were printed or rather carved out on that wood and hung on the factory If you go to any Lego office today, you will find this slab hanging around. These words translate to the core essence of the brand, which means only the best is good enough, and that is the spirit of our brand. When it comes to children, only the best is good enough. That is the next brick in the evolution of the brand as well. That is the obsession with quality that we have, and we completely live by it as employees there. moving on um you know with an unwavering focus on quality where could you go only up even in the middle of what we now know was the great depression this company was growing growing and how and then what can go wrong well in one of the unluckiest incidents in the world that could happen um this factory was hit by a fire and everything everything that ole had was erased and wiped out and destroyed the most precious thing that actually got destroyed that evening was ole's spirit to continue this business and he decided or rather almost decided to abandon this business forever it was only i think a sense of responsibility uh, towards his sons and the 26 employees who were left behind in bilun that kept him going 
He got a lot of offers from other companies in Denmark, but he decided to stay back in Bilun. And with a little help from these employees and you know the family, he decided to rebuild the factory again. What came out was a factory which was obviously more modern than the warehouse that they had. And what did that mean? That meant that they could actually go into mass production. They could also actually uh, you know, use new age materials now, move on from wood to something uh, different, notably plastic. And this, you will see, becomes a very important chapter as we go ahead in the history of the brand. Um, now, not only the destruction of the factory, but also this is the time when they were faced with the World War II. Good quality wood had become rare. And so what do you do? Ole decided to take yet another punt, and he invested hugely into a very expensive then injection for a plastic molding machine. He brought it and installed it into his factory, much to the displeasure of his children. Godfred was once uh, found quoting to a newspaper, saying you can make very cute little nice things in plastic, but then wood is always stronger. So the sons also decided to persuade the father and said, plastic is not good enough, we should move out. And these are the famous four words that Ole used to his sons at that point in time to say, can't you see? You know, if we were to actually build in plastic, we will be able to move out of Bilund and Denmark to the rest of the world. And the globe is where we will be able to make the children happy and bring smiles to their faces. I must say now, he was definitely a visionary. Not only because, you know, we, he gave us the brick that we see today, but also because decades later, another factory actually took fire. And that's the time when the sons decided to absolutely abandon the wood business and go back to where their father had shown faith, and that is plastic. Uh, this is also another brick which actually shows resilience and innovation at times that were changing rapidly. Now, you know, the business is doing well. The sons have joined in. They are taking their part. They are moving across the world. And this is the time when the sons had started going out to the globe and gathering feedback. They were very keen to listen to customers and kids to understand what is doing well and how could they do better. At one point in time, Godfred met one of the retailers who simply said, toys are not that great these days. And Godfred said, what's wrong? Toys are just great. We are doing very well. He said, yeah, they're doing well, but there is no system. There is no system. These are the words that then kept haunting Godfrey throughout the night. And he said, what do these words essentially mean? The next morning when he got up, it all made sense to him. He said, yes, there is no system. And what does that mean actually? He said, you know, kids imagine and create. But what are we giving them as toy makers? We are giving them ready-made toys. Yes, I love a car, and so there is a car for you. Yes, I love a dollhouse, and so there is a dollhouse for you. And what if I want a horse tomorrow? And what if I want, want a rocket day after? So he said there has to be a system. Yes, these bricks could be placed together, but there was no mechanism to lift it. And he thought, and he thought, and thank God he thought. Because what he came up with at that point in time is the classic interlocking mechanism, tube mechanism, in the bricks that we see today. They click and fit together. Now, you know, a lot of you ask us, is the box that you sell equal to one build? Can I really buy this box for my child? It's so expensive. And then he just builds it once, and I just display it, and it's over. I have to tell you this, that if your father bought a box, at whatever age group you are, if your father bought a box many, many years back, and if you are the one who's buying it for yourself or your child today, you could just merge all of these boxes together and the bricks will fit and click together as beautifully as they did 90 years back. And, and they will continue to do that 90 years hence from here. And that is the system in play. We allow the children to imagine and create whatever it is that they actually imagine in their heads. So they could actually decide to build a rocket today and a plane tomorrow and a car day after and their worlds could also merge together in the same system. That is the system in play. Okay, so that brings me to chapter seven. All is going well. There are bricks and bricks and bricks that are selling. Sets are all doing well. And then, you know, we have been listening to customers and we have been listening to retailers. But what about our core consumers, the children? 
the company had learned its own lessons in saying that we need to listen we need to see feedback and we need to grow with that what better way than observe our kids playing and understand their play patterns this is the time when lego as a group opened its doors you know opens its offices to children uh, even today all the children are invited to our offices to play with the bricks um they were given hordes and hordes of bricks and they are allowed to play what do we discover we discover that children are very happy playing with our bricks but then the manager said that there is a gap a clear gap between what the child wants and what we have on offer and what's that gap you know we have subtly and slowly moved into the age of self expression here and the child himself or herself wants to be a part of the play he wants to be in the castle he wants to be riding that horse he wants to be flying that rocket but we don't have a figure to represent the child in there very simple problem one thinks and yes we also thought that there was a simple solution to offer so that is the birth of the mini figure a four brick simple figure with movable hands and legs but that changed the fate for us because it was the child who was a part of the play now he or she could himself or herself see them as part of the play this mini figure as mini as it looks to be changed the fate of the brand once again we grew about six times our size in the next decade only owing to this mini figure and then you say you know we have the bricks we have the sets children are building they are in everything is going just right what can possibly now go wrong times have changed once again and the kids have gone back to screens or rather gone first time to screens and video games and there are fleets and fleets of consultants for the first time at the lego office advising them on the fact that the box of bricks is very humble it's not good enough to be keep the children besotted because children are now into tamagotchis and nintendos and whatever um that's the time um there was a knee jerk reaction for the first time by the senior management at the lego group and they decided to give the consultants a listen uh, if there are any consultants in the audience um it's no offense intended here but this is the time when they actually decided to give the consultants a listen and they said okay let's make our sets flashier there was jewelry there was motors there were lights everything that was added to the lego sets it was actually no longer the vision that christensen had started with it had really become a product that was trying desperately to stay relevant in times that had seemingly changed overnight right sales were plummeting and this time in my head there was no factory fire but the brand had gone up in smoke the brand was almost at the verge of filing for bankruptcy and this is the time when they opened their doors to a new ceo a 36 year old man called yon v nutstrop who we very fondly call as jvk in our office um 36 year old guy who's come in from a consulting background and for the first time outside the christensen family decides to take over his strategy and what he has achieved out of that strategy has become one of the biggest lessons in the turnaround of corporate history it is actually put together in a book called brick by brick um and that book has some of the most essential lessons that are given in business academics today what was his strategy you would think the strategy was simple go back to basics and what did that mean so he simply came back and he said let's cut the number of pieces that we are developing right now to half let's sell off all the lego land parks drastic as it may seem right now only to focus on what we do best with the audience that we work best with that is children he got the design team absolutely focused on understanding what children do play and how and said innovate but innovate profitably this is the first time when the group invested in home grown ips and that is the birth of bionicles which uh, may be new to some of you but that was also the birth of something new that is collaborations we actually opened our doors to collaborating with what was trending at that point in time and that gave birth to one of the things which was our collaboration with star wars uh, riding onto the pop culture the home grown ips and this collaboration itself snapped lego brand out of bankruptcy and how is a is a story to tell 
So now things have started looking better. And then wizened and humbled by the lessons that we have learned, we decide not to ignore any of the demographics that matter to us. And one of the demographics that mattered to us and had been royally ignored were the adults. You know, um, we had a lot of motivated fans who were continuing to build us. They were passionate about building, but we were always focused on the kids. And by this time, from a time perspective, we had also entered the age of community building. So this is the time when the Lego group decided to actually create a platform and bring in all the adult fans together. That platform uh, of the adult fans allowed them to vote for ideas and submit their ideas. Some of those ideas were then picked up by our designers and are some of our best selling products. We fondly call this community the AFALS, the adult fans of Lego. Uh, this is hugely growing across the globe even today, including India. I don't know if some of you sitting in the audience are AFALS, but this is for all of you who, who enjoy building, that this is the time when the group actually opened its arms to the adult fans as well riding on to innovation with a different audience altogether. And then we said, while we stay true to our core of children and role play and storytelling, the way storytelling is happening has got upgraded. Children are now a part of a content revolution. What can we do? And that's the time in 2014 that we decided that time was ripe for us to invest in content. The first time that the Lego group went out and made a movie, the Lego movie. The budget for this movie was very, very minuscule. But the movie was one of the biggest grossers at the box office that year in 2014. Not only did it change the way the Lego group looked at content, but that was the year where Brand Finance reported that Lego had actually toppled Ferrari to become the most powerful brand in the world. And since then, we've never looked back on content. So chapter 11, figuratively and otherwise, meant the end of you know, that part. And that brings me to the final chapter, chapter 12, which is the chapter that we are li living and breathing today. It's a chapter that I lovingly say, a chapter of promise. A promise of keeping children playing with you know, things, with, with, a, with an environment that they are growing in. We talk of sustainability today, we talk of energy conservation, we talk of diversity and inclusion. And what does that mean? As I stand here representing my brand today, there are tons and tons of people who are actually working towards getting us uh, sustainable materials to build. You know, uh, replacing the plastic that you see today. We are changing our packaging from plastic to paper. From an inclusion perspective, the minifig that we just saw is no longer the minifigs that you have only seen. You see not only all colors of skin and hair to make it more inclusive, but you also see all sorts of disabilities presented by those minifigs because we want to give each child an equal opportunity to play, and adults as well, of course. So that, that is actually uh, you know, the end of what I wanted to say. And at the end, I just want to conclude by saying that we are not 90 years old. We are obviously 90 years young, and we hope that we can keep all of you young with many, many years of play that we have in us. Thank you.